In this module, we'll be looking at large connectors. So this includes bolts and coach screws, and it can also be used for dowels. We will look at examples of bolted connections, some capacities of type one and type two connections, and detailing that's required for bolted connections. This slide shows a picture of some bolted connections in a truss. And so here the architect has chosen to express the bolts. They're easily visible in the structure and they're doing a structural job as well as fulfilling an architectural function. Likewise, in this truss here, you can see the bolted connections. In this truss, there's a steel plate behind each of the timber members. So those bolts are transferring load out of the timber member into a steel plate that sits behind it. The steel plate then transfers the loads across the node and into other timber members. In this detail, the steel plate is used to transfer the load from one timber member into another, but in this case, the steel plate is buried inside the timber members. A slot is cut into the timber members, the steel plate is inserted there, so it's invisible on the outside of the connection. Bolted connections. A type one bolted connection will use shear in the connection to transmit load across a shear interface. So this is a type one connection where I am loading this member in tension and it's transferring load into this member using shear across the bolt shank. So that's a classic use of a bolt. A type two connection would have the bolt in tension and that's a much more difficult connection to establish using bolts. Type one connections, this is the capacity of a type one bolted connection. We've got a phi factor, and the phi factor is drawn from a table that's specific for bolted connections. We've got a K1 factor that is appropriate for bolted connections. K16 is a head fixity factor, and again, if the bolt passes through a thick metal plate, that metal plate can stop the bolt from rotating and give the connection extra strength. The K17 factor allows for multiple rows of bolts along the length of a connection. And finally, the number of bolts and the capacity of a single bolt in shear. K17 for bolts is quite different to the K17 for nails. With K17 for nails, all you had to do was count the number of rows of fasteners and look up the table. With K17 for bolts, we have to work out whether or not the bolts are actually going to stop the member from shrinking or swelling if it changes in moisture content. We call that transverse restraint and we use different K17 factors if the connection is going to give transverse restraint to the bolts. The capacity of a bolt depends on the relationship of the force to the grain direction. So if the load is applied parallel to the grain, the, the bolt has a higher capacity than if the load is applied perpendicular to grain. In this connection here, if I push down on the horizontal member, the load is applied to the vertical member parallel to the grain and to the horizontal member perpendicular to the grain. So as I push down, the bolt is pushing up on the piece of timber and loading it perpendicular to the grain. There is a video clip available that indicates why the bolt has different capacities in those directions. But load direction is very important for the capacity of bolted joints. The characteristic system capacity of a bolt in a joint is given on this particular slide. And there are two different capacities. There's QSKL for parallel to grain and QSKP for perpendicular to grain. And they are each found by looking up different tables. So to find the characteristic capacity of a bolt, the first thing is to work out what is the direction of the force relative to the grain in the timber. If the force is parallel to the grain, as it is for the vertical member in this configuration, we use the table that you can see on the slide at the moment. On the other hand, if the load is perpendicular to the grain, there is a completely different table 
that we use to find the capacity of the bolt in the joint. Then we use the species strength joint. The joint strength group is given a J or a JD number, and that's indicated in the left-hand column on this table. Then the effective thickness of the timber. Thicker timber generally has higher bolt capacity because there's more timber at the bolt timber interface to give high bearing transfer from the timber into the bolt. And finally, it's a function of the diameter of the bolt. The bigger the bolt, the bigger its capacity. Now this model illustrates what happens with a bolt and a bolt is a, a bolted connection is made using a bolt, a washer and a uh, threaded portion of the bolt that goes onto a nut. However, we could make a similar kind of connection without any threads simply by embedding a dowel into the timber. So by drilling a hole and driving a solid dowel like this into the timber, we can gain the benefits of a bolted connection without having uh, a bolt head and nut visible on the outside of the timber. The capacities are very similar. The capacity of a type 2 bolted connection is given by these formulae, and there are two formulae. One is limited by the tensile strength of the bolt. So if the bolt is put in tension and it fails in tension, then the joint will come apart. The other mode of failure is by crushing under the head so that the tension in the bolt leads to high localised compression in the timber immediately under the bolt head and that can cause localised failure. So two different capacity equations for type 2 bolted connections. Now detailing in bolted connections. There are minimum end distances, spacings and edge distances for bolted connections, but all of them are related to the direction in which the load is applied. The standard gives different values for the spacings, edge distances and end distances depending on whether the load is applied parallel to the grain or perpendicular to the grain. So if the load is applied perpendicular to the grain, we're aiming to minimise the effect of splitting and we use different edge distances, end distances and spacings for those configurations. Finally, there are some places where we can't get in behind the bolt to put a nut on the end of the bolt. And in those cases, we have to use a coach screw. So this shows what a coach screw is. It's a large diameter connection like a bolt, but it also has a wood thread on the end of the screw. And so it can be drilled into the timber and it functions very much as a bolt, except in withdrawal. And its withdrawal strength is very similar to the withdrawal strength of screws. So in summary, bolts can transmit large forces. They tend to be used on much larger connections. Type 1 connections are much more common than type 2 connections in bolts and the capacity is de dependent on the direction of the grain. Bolts have different capacity if the force is applied parallel to the grain to the capacity where the force is applied perpendicular to the grain. And likewise, the spacings, the end distance and edge distance is also dependent on the direction in which the force is applied.